It's XFM. I am Gary Crowley. It says it. It's written down in front of me. This is Good Morning London. I'm very pleased to say that my special guests, Ed and uh, Phil from Radiohead, have joined me. Welcome. Good Thank morning. You. Hello. And, of course, that was from uh, Pablo Honey, <laughs> and that was Anyone Can Play Guitar. Do you ever go back and listen to that album? Do you listen to your records, or...? Uh, I, no, I mean, I listened to Pablo Honey for the first time ever, probably since we made it about half a year ago, because I was kind of quite curious to hear how it sounded. And I, I'm, well, we've often we've been in a shop or something. You do these dreadful sort of in-store signings, the signings, and, yeah. and they play it over and over again. So you you kind of tend to ignore it. But it sounded all right. It sounds like a young band. I mean, it was six years ago that we made it. So it's a reasonable debut effort. <laughs> yeah. Not bad. Not bad. I mean, what were you? You know, what was sort of like? What what frame of mind were you in when you were recording that album as well? Was it an enjoyable album to make? Well, it was a lot shorter, actually, than, than the uh, than the Benz and OK Computer to make, so I suppose it was enjoyable in that, that way. So what was the time difference then, filming? Well, it took three three weeks to make Pablo Honey, and it took eight months to make the Benz, and then yeah. over a year to make OK Computer. That's so, so you know, we're kind of it? stretching it out as we go along. Yeah, so how long's the next one going to take then? <laughs> <laughs> Three years. <laughs> yeah. So a new year has arrived. It's 1998. Um, Ed, you were just talking about being in Spain yeah. over the Christmas I went out there, period. I, Tell us about that. I just went out there for New Year. I've got a friend who lives out there, and uh, I thought it'd be nice to have a bit of change of scenery because I'm not. I hate Christmas and New Year. I'm one of these people. So you know, people either love it or hate it. I hate it. I find it a really depressing time. All that sort of families have got to get on and stuff like that. So it's like get <laughs> out the humbug. country. Exactly. But <laughs> and it was great. It was really good. They they they. The Spanish have an amazing capacity to party, so I'm kind of a bit weary now, about six days of, of serious drinking wine and everything, but they're out every night, and the thing is, Madrid, people are out to like, you know, they don't go out till 11.30 at night, and then they're out till about seven or eight in the morning, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm all You're right. You're not looking too bad, <laughs> on it, then. You're not looking if it's been, you know, six days of, of drinking. What about you, Phil? What about for you over Christmas, New Year's Eve? Well, unlike it, I actually embraced that, that Christmas <laughs> spirit in its entirety. Uh, so I was there, and I actually just had quite a quiet one with, uh, with family, family and friends. Right. Just and whereabouts were both of you actually at 12 o'clock on New Year's Eve as well? I wanted to ask that. Let's start with you, Ed. Where were you and what were you doing? I was, I was at this party. On a, it was on the seventh floor looking above the kind of the skyline of Madrid. And they have this tradition that you have to, in Spain, you have a glass of carver or Spanish champagne. And you have to eat a grape on each chime. And um, I was a bit worried because apparently it's not, it's very difficult to do, but I've got such a big mouth I was able to do it. So 12 grapes on each chime was fine. So that's where I was. I was, I was thinking of, of everyone back in Oxford, of course. God, he's so sad. He just <laughs> has to make all these things up about his life. He doesn't think it's exciting enough. Actually, he's it's sad. wonderful, Phil. <laughs> so it's working. How can I'm a you liar. <laughs> what about you? Whereabouts were you on New Year's Eve? <clears throat> um, oh... Oh, I've got to make something up now. I can't tell you what I was actually doing. <laughs> something there. equally as exciting I was in Bali, as well. man. Yeah, that's right, man. No, actually, it's the carrying on with a friends and family routine. Uh, I was with my, with my sister. I mean, this into time... Into New Year. And where were you, Gary? Me? Yeah. I was at home with my uh, other half, uh, yeah. sitting in front of the TV, actually, sadly enough, watching oh, uh, cool. TFI yeah. Friday. But uh, it got to about one o'clock, so we sort of like decided to go around to some friends for a drink after that. Excellent. And, uh, of course, I forgot at about half past two, three in the morning that I was, in fact, working the next morning as well but uh, considering everything it wasn't too bad i mean this time of year is, and, and also sort of you know that kind of new yeah. year period it's a great time for sort of like reflection as well and i mean you said you know you find it a little bit sort of like depressing but looking back at 1997 um you know for both of you i mean what were the sort of like the joys and and the agonies maybe that that's really sort of like stand out for you um actually some of the joys and agonies came in one package which mm. was um glastonbury <laughs> Um, actually, you know, the whole thing of actually going along and playing at that event, it was an amazing weekend, and actually being part of that was, it was a really great honour. Um, and walking out and playing the first few songs was just absolutely incredible, seeing the audience and all the fires and everything like spreading up the hillside. Uh, and then it actually turned into about the most stressful show we've ever done. We've ever done. The Glastonbury did. Yeah. yeah. Why? Well, Tom's monitors went down, and Tom had had a problem all the night because he hadn't, I mean... Uh, you probably you, you a bit further back mm. raised up so you could actually get over the lights and see the audience but in the front you couldn't see a thing because the lighting computer had gone down 
and our lighting guy was panicking and we had these and Tom especially had it and he relies on obviously he's a front man he's got to have con some kind of contact with the audience and he had these white lights in his eyes for all of the gig the monitors went down you're in this uh, you know we were built we'd been we we'd been building up to this gig for like eight weeks yeah, I'm it's sure, kind of, yeah. we'd done several little shows and we did a week before we did a big show in Ireland to kind of lessen the impact but it wasn't the same it's like this is blasphemy this is a big one and so of course suddenly you know Tom was confronted with the biggest nightmare scenario it's like your worst dream mm -hmm. and uh, i remember it was like talk show host kind of broke down and uh and tom tom said you know i can't go on you know this is unbelievable this is nightmare and we said well and johnny and i was saying we sort of got into a huddle and we said let's just get through the set we've got like you know three more songs to do and because we had no reaction because you're on a stage that size you don't really know how well it's going mm. down and especially when you couldn't see the audience so it's like you know it, it was a very bizarre we couldn't gauge it and then of course when we went off and we heard this roar and tom came back on and and said andy turn on the lights and everything and um we kind of it, it, that helped a lot but it was it was i think you know for tom especially it was like his whole life sort of played in front of him those you know that last mm. yeah. 45 minutes of the what set what was the thinking generally in the band after you'd come off stage then after that can you remember what you were you know, I think we're all a bit shell shocked yeah. really <laughs> <laughs> Where's the bar? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was like too shocked to have a drink. You yeah, know? you just you thought you'd let the whole thing down. We thought we hadn't done a good gig. We thought, you know, mm. we thought this is this is it. And we, you know, you're trying to like a something really traumatic. You're trying to wipe away the memory yeah. of it yeah. immediately. So it's like get on the bus, you know, let's go home early, sort of thing. Well, think about some more yeah. anyway. <laughs> think about some more. We'll talk about it. I mean, I'm very pleased to say that you're still going to be here. Um, you're going to stay here all the way through until one o'clock. Um, Phil, I think you're going to introduce the first record. You've chosen DJ Shadow. Tell us about, you know, your love affair with him and the band, really. I mean, all of the band. <laughs> I say. I mean, yeah. You it. know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's all out, folks. We're all boys here anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well... DJ, DJ Shadow has just uh, done some shows of us on the um, the dates that we um, did in uh, when was they? end of November. December. Yeah. yeah, end of November. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. The arena. I was there, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, he's somebody who um, influenced us whilst we were making OK Computer, um, and we Tom has actually done uh, a track with him for the Uncle project. Um, and it's somebody we love, you know, it was, it was amazing to be able to watch him every night on those shows, and so here's a track from him. Radio Head, joining me all the way through until one o'clock. That's DJ Shadow, who was a recent special guest on their UK tour, and that's a track entitled Building Steam with a Grain of Salt. Am I right in saying that? I think you are. And what does this <laughs> track um, sound like then, the one that, um, that Tom's done with him? Have you guys heard that? Yeah. It's. It, I think. I mean, we. I think we all think it's brilliant. It's like, you know, they. they it was. We had a couple of days off in San Francisco, and Tom went into uh, uh, the studio with Shadow and did this thing, and it's. It's brilliant. I think. I. You know, if it. If. If it ain't a smash it single, then <laughs> nothing is. You know. So spoke Mystic Meg here exclusively <laughs> on 104.9. I mean, normally in the past, it's been Tom, um, occasionally Johnny as well, yeah. um, coming in to do the interviews as well. Um, you know, you guys sort of like get your chance now as well. Is there anything that you've been dying to say um, over the past sort of like couple of years? Well, we've been debriefed for about two years. We've been preparing for this big moment, you know. We've, we've got I'm the kind of... we just up, though, that's once, right. we, once we get here. Yeah, I, that, that whole thing about Christmas and New Year, that's kind of a typical radio headline, bar humbug, don't like that. So we're <laughs> Kind of at, la at long last, we're sort of getting the idea. We we're, we're sort of entering to the spirit of the Radiohead yeah. um, interview. That's right. Well, I mean, um, you know, obviously, sort of like Tom is very much the, the the sort of like the public face of the band. Does that mean, in a sense, that you know, you guys can sort of, you know, go off and, and enjoy being in the band without having to, you know, have all of the grief that goes with, you know, being the immediate face of the band? Um, I think. I mean, you, you're right. I mean, Tom is is the most recognisable face of of Radiohead. But, uh, you know, when, when you look at uh, over this past year, when we've been going around touring, I mean, the, the actual, um, all, all the promotion duties, you know, like doing the interviews being shared between uh, the rest of us, really. Yeah. You know, Tom has done interviews where he's felt that he can actually give something of himself in those interviews so that somewhere where he feels he can do something significant. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it's he's in this situation where a lot of people pay a lot of credence to, to what he says and so you know he does he doesn't really like to repeat himself so he doesn't like to come back and actually say anything until he's got something new to sure. say yeah um 
but you know we don't mind being parrots do we no <laughs> but the thing is you also you also, you also have a responsibility you know we've been a band for like 12 years we're all at school so part of the thing is you know when when someone says look and you know tom said at the beginning of the, when the album i really don't want to do that many interviews like, i you know i don't enjoy them mm. and part of the thing is like you know if if someone says that you know, you, you shoulder the, 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 the responsibility or whatever, and that's part of, you know, being in a band. We are a band. It's not mm. like Tom's a solo artist. We're a band. We've been together for 12, 13 years now. So, you know, we're, we're, we're cool with all the sort of, you know, if he doesn't want to do that, it's fine. And he's the, he's the lead singer, you know. They take all the... They have all the, the, the weight of everything else. So, you know, he's got enough to enough on his plate as yeah. it is. Well, as soon as though he's not here, can we talk about his annoying habits? <laughs> <laughs> Let's dish the dirt. <laughs> Tom, actually, I shared a room with Tom for, for three years. Yeah. And I have to say, he was a perfectly civilised person to share a room with. Yeah. What kind of so, person in the morning when he wakes up? How would you describe him, Phil? What's he like at eight o'clock in the morning when he's got to get up to do interviews? <laughs> Paint a picture for us. <laughs> Fluffy. Really? Fluffy. <laughs> That's a surreal picture, <laughs> but I'm going to live with that one. We asked people to fax in earlier on this morning some questions yeah. um, for you guys. You got one. Um, no, 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 no. We've got um, we've got a fistful here. Um, so I'd like to ask you first of all from John in Molesley, and um, where do you get your ideas from for your videos, and which is your favourite radio video um, to date as well? Ed, let's start with you. Um, the ideas for the video always come from the video directors themselves. What we do is we script out, and people actually video directors actually write in scripts and and do a plot and we mainly go on what the idea is and what their track record is as well see what they you know they've got a show reel or whatever so we know that they're capable of actually executing what they you know what they've planned to do and um my favorite video would have to be it's our new one seeing as we've got the guy who made it <laughs> in the <laughs> room doing right documentary. Next grant did a, has just done a fantastic video for no surprises and it's just Tom, and it's very, very eerie, and it's, um, it's, it's brilliant. I saw it for the first time, Grant, about two weeks ago. So. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's really Tell good. us about Grant, because he's standing here with a camera. Now, am I right in saying that you're, you're actually in the process of making a documentary That's at the right. moment? So, to, to what extent and, and, and why? Well, Grant's been chattering us uh, since, since we started um, doing all the promotion for the album back in Barcelona. Uh, and we thought it'd be interesting just to have somebody with us um, throughout the whole you know, course of OK Computer and doing all the touring and everything, just to see how, how everything developed, um, to catch our witty moments, <laughs> catch our <laughs> not-so-friendly moments, and all of that. Um, and so, uh, yes, I, Grant, Grant's had a lot of footage it's, it's, I think he, he has said it's been quite interesting actually from you know the way he started working at the beginning of the year it was all quite frenetic and everything was just very much on, on the hoof if you like uh, and it's, it's developed into this situation where you know we, we've uh, we know we know our way around uh, around this album now and how to well and yeah. what we want to say about it and so yeah. everything's become much more settled now yeah. so grant could i ask you to come close to the to the <laughs> microphone i mean how do you see this video then is this something that people are going to be able to buy um a long form thing or is it going to be something that's going to be shown at the cinema um i think the idea is to get it as a tv program right first of all and then it's really up to the record company whether they want to sell it as a tape or whatever yeah and so, how, so how do you see this documentary what are you sort of like trying to capture in this film um well the, the real challenge is to try and make a documentary about a rock band that doesn't feel like it's just a rockumentary um because they deserve more <laughs> they deserve more than that you know it's uh, trying to make a documentary that fits with what the imagery on okay computer is right so try and extend that out because it okay computer to me is quite a sort of real album the imagery is about the world and so it's just extending that into and including the band in shots i mean right so how much stuff have you done and i mean how much more have you still to do as well um i've covered i've done about five shoots with them um out in various locations there's one more in japan and australia and then some sort of tying together shoots to do in about may finish it by june right and what's it like for you guys to kind of sort of permanently have somebody pointing a camera at you well at Do first you get used to it at first obviously it's a bit weird but um you know grant is 
we you know we get on with him socially as well so he you know it's it's been fine we, the, the trouble is when the, you know the first kind of couple of days that there's a camera around you're sort of yeah you're trying to make sure you, <laughs> you get your best angle or whatever you think it's your best angle and trying to be cool and then and then that's a sod this you know just and 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 that's a great thing about he's been able to get stuff that we don't realize he's there and he's shown us you know bits and pieces and it's like jesus you were there it's like so that's 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 the great thing about it. and the fact yeah. that it's not going to be we're always very wary about we didn't want a rockumentary warts and all kind of you know the thing that spinal tap completely sends up and is brilliant mm. for but we didn't want that grant anyway is is he's 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 a director and he's got his it's like working with him he came in with his own ideas and it's like this is as much your thing as our thing so you've got to you've got to have a license to do what you want so it's it hopefully it'll turn out really well okay let's play a record um loads more faxes uh, questions to ask you and i've got loads as well but it's echo and the bunny man yeah. up next yeah and uh, never stop yeah Ed, this is your choice would you like to introduce it yeah i mean you know i was like one of those 12 13 years ago so one of those those kids teenagers with the long coat and the the spiky hair and and the you know chain smoking at 14 and and them and the smiths and and kind of you two were and bands like, you know, Bauhaus as well were like the, my soundtrack to my teenage years. So I hadn't heard Echo and the Bunnymen for years, so like going through the library, it's like, yeah, I'd love to hear Never Stop Again. Guests on this Tuesday afternoon here on 104.9 are Phil and Ed from Radiohead, and there goes um, Echo and the Bunnymen and Never Stop. And you were saying that brings back some memories of buying your first car, Ed. Yeah, well, we, we were also talking about this gig we did about 12 years ago when we like did one gig a year in this place called the Caribbean Club in Oxford, and this was a track that we all got, we all got vibe up to when we went on stage you know they were literally honestly there were like 25 people there but we would get like really vibed up to it and you, mm. <laughs> you I was I actually had this admission for Ed just before, before the record finished I was actually sick before that show <laughs> <laughs> rack with nerves <laughs> so I mean was it because of bands like the Bunny Men and the Smiths and the ones that you mentioned you two as well that you know inspired you to start Radiohead I mean, yeah and R.E.M. Like and the Pixies yeah. and, and a lot of the American bands as well at that time because, I mean, there was that very barren, it seemed to be quite barren, sort of 87-ish through to about, you know, 86, 87. A lot of what was really the stuff that we were listening to is, was over on the East Coast in America and, you know, Pixies, Throne Muses, Dinosaur Jr. and R.E.M., of course. Yeah. And, um, you know, I went up to Manchester, I, went, I was at University of Manchester, and, and literally the only reason I went up, and this is God's honest truth, was because I was from Oxford. We didn't have any gigs, and it was because of the Smiths and New Order. Of course, I got up to Manchester, 87, first, first month they split up the Smiths. So I was like, I was gutted. So, um, yeah, they were, they were all very important. Um, it, was, it was, you know, I think there was a, you know, up to about 86, there was a lot of great music in England, and then I think it kind of went pretty pear-shaped. Mm. And what is it about Oxford as well? I mean, you know, the last few years, I mean, we've seen you guys come out of there and Supergrass. I mean, the Candy Skins were in um, a month or so ago as well. You were talking mm. about some new bands as well that you've heard, Ed. I mean, is there something sort of like special that, you know, about the place that inspires, you know, musical talent? Um, I don't think it's the city itself that it inspires no. it, really. Um, but having said that, it's a very good place to be in a band. You know, there's, there, there's never this sense that there's, like, you know, the one sound that should come out of Oxford. In, in that respect, you know, it encourages bands to go their own way. Yeah. Um, and also, it has, you know, it does have a focus. I mean, if you go back ten years ago, uh, Oxford didn't have a music scene at all. Uh, it was the last place any and it was, man would be, yeah. be seen, seen alive, really. It was Ride who opened it all yeah. up, because yeah. before that, you didn't think as a band from Oxford, people didn't take you seriously, you know. I remember we came down to to London and, and went to see someone at Island Records and it was kind of like, you know, this is an 88 and someone kind of, you know, well, poo-pooed us and sort of like, you're from Oxford. But Rides gave a kind of a credibility to everything and it, consequently when we got signed up, we didn't have to do a gig in London. They all came down to Oxford. And Actually, um, I think why we might have been poo-pooed at Islands because we weren't very good at that point. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that, that, that probably... Yeah. Development, then. It should have been a development deal. <laughs> Let's ask a couple more of these faxes uh, that we can um, that have been um, coming in from um, Radiohead fans here at XFM. One from Suki B. Um, is today a good day or a bad day? Excellent day. Yeah, very good day. Yeah. All the better for coming to XFM. Oh. Right? No, oh, you sweet talkers. <laughs> yeah. And also, I'm going to go straight to a final question. This is a weird one. It's a very surreal one. Do you believe in fairies? Fairies? <laughs> That's quite a festive question, really, isn't it? Yes, I suppose you could say That's that, yeah. Lovely. For me, no. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, well, we like to have a balanced uh, opinion here, so yes. OK, moving on. This one's from Connor. When you are writing um, songs, do you imagine them in a live context or on a recorded album? No, you, I think we, you, you can't write songs for, like, the live context. We, we sort of do it in the rehearsal room, but what we find a lot of the problem we, we've actually on OK Computer we play quite a few of the songs live I mean Paranoid Android was we took that out live last year and that was originally 12 minutes long and um, you realise that when you when you get back into studio and you actually play it live and consign it to tape you think it sounds good but it's actually a crock of whatever <laughs> you know so you, you, you kind of have a starting point but you, you with us we never really sort of know where we're going we have a few sort of pointers but um, you can't ever imagine what it's going to be like live because I mean it was difficult when we came to rehearsing to go out live for OK Computer we spent three weeks playing in the songs because a lot of them we actually hadn't sort of they've become a lot more complicated and it was just getting into playing these songs which we'd never played live. I mean, playing live is a large part of what you do in Radiohead. What mm. kind of things do you miss when you are out on the road? Um, I think the, the um, ability to actually work on, on new songs. I mean, we can work in sound checks and we have set up a, a little studio in tell the back us about, of our bus. Tell us about but, that, Phil. Um, well, it's just basically, um, uh, it's, uh, it's a digital studio in the back of a bus and a song which is one of the bonus tracks on, on uh, No Surprises, a song called Palo Alto. Um, an awful lot of the work for, for that track was actually done on the bus. So, you know, there, there's, um, we, you, there's the ability to actually work on new stuff, but I think we really like to be able to throw ourselves into yeah. like, a, a, a b bunch of new songs at any particular time, just go up to our rehearsal room just outside Oxford and just immerse ourselves. Uh, in, in that place and you miss that when, when you go out mm. touring. Um, do you kind of cocoon yourselves in your own world when, when you're on the road as well? I mean, do you enjoy staying in hotels or they're necessary? You have to get evil? like you have to get a routine together. That's mm. the most important thing. I mean, like we're, we're we're definitely creatures of habit. It's like when we rehearse and record, we do that. We cocoon ourselves when we rehearse and record. So there is a sense of that when you when you go out on the road. But the problem is going out on the road is that you've got so much other stuff going on you've got promotional duties and it can get kind of quite fragmented you can suddenly realize hey honestly i haven't spoken to to colin for like six hours or something because you're all off doing different things or you've got something to do so um it, it it's kind of it, it's it's just a balance you know it's yeah. i heard a, i heard a thing of like it takes you about a month to get used to or two months to get used to being on the road and once you do that, because it's you first go out there. And I remember, like when we were first out with that, you know, in May with OK Computer touring it, it was like lying on your bunk in your bus, going along in the middle of the night at 80 miles an hour. And you think, Jesus, this is a weird lifestyle. It really mm. is bizarre. But um, you know, you get used to that. Human beings are amazingly resilient animals. You know, we do adapt quite well to our surroundings. But then at the end of the touring. You know, it takes you about two months to get used to being off the road. So, like, at nine o'clock each evening or whatever, you have this inbuilt... <laughs> you can tell with you. <laughs> where's the stage? Where's the stage, man? I mean, where's the audience? I feel drunk here. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> One, two, three, four. <laughs> and, and what about when you're doing sound checks as well? You know, you mentioned about working on new songs. Do you ever sort of, like, slip in some cover versions when you're um, doing sound checks as well, just for a little bit of light relief? And if so... Yeah. Really? Do you <laughs> Talking about Radiohead. <laughs> <laughs> um, cover versions. Actually, we've not been too great with cover versions. No. We've, we've shied away from them yeah. quite a lot. We uh, did Nobody Does It Better for a while. We had to do this thing on Carly's, MTV. Yeah. Yeah. Not, right. About two years ago, we had this slot, and they wanted us desperately to, for MTV, this kind of live thing, to play it, to do a cover version. We spent two days rehearsing it and it was really traumatic because the reason that we when we start as a band we never a lot of bands start with cover versions we never did because we couldn't play them mm. we could only play our own songs so um it was a bit traumatic but and we've kind of we've hauled it out in in the past but i think the last time we played it was the astoria we did this low-key gig when we were supposed to do like all b-side set but tom became ill so we couldn't do that but we we hadn't played nobody does it better for like a year and tom was on stage i mean it was the encores and tom was on stage playing this playing this um playing a song on his own acoustically and uh and johnny and i and and colin were like you know backstage like what the chords for no because we said we'll do nobody does it better and we were like we were sitting there with get us an acoustic guitar working it out and on a wing and a prayer and it was dreadful it was really <laughs> really bad it up that so night well, then. <laughs> and it was really awful because you know it's a pretty complex and it's a really beautiful song it's mm. an amazing song and we just and 
we, I think we played it well a couple of times and we played it in a total ten times and we've murdered it the other times. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone's so drunk by then, it just becomes this big sing-along, so it's kind of all right. Right. Now, we've got, um, I'm very pleased to say, some copies of the new single with these new tracks as well, mm. which we'll play a little bit later on in the programme. So if you guys can think about a question, um, we can ask that one after our next record. Um, Phil, you've chosen the next tune. It's Blur and it's Pop Scene. Why have you chosen this one? Um, I d went to see Blur just before, just before Christmas up in Birmingham and I was absolutely blown away by them. I thought um, there, there was just so much energy coming off the stage and uh, I think they're one of the best live bands around. I think it's a real shame that they're, they're actually stopping um, to their, their live performances. Um, this is uh, Pop Scene's, you know, one of their Brilliant. earlier singles and it's an absolutely incredible song. <laughs> Morning London on this Tuesday afternoon and Phil and Ed from Readyhead are my very special guest Claire Sturgis is going to be here at one o'clock looking after you all the way through until four o'clock. Um, it's been a pretty unbelievable last month for, uh, <laughs> for you really as far as um, all these polls yeah. um, are mm. concerned. Can I start with the XFM all time listeners um, top 100? Um, you had um, five tracks in the uh, XFM um, all time top 100 as wow. voted by the listeners number one was Creep, Street Spirit Fade Out was number five, what? Uh, Fake Plastic Plastic Trees was 11, Paranoid Android 32, and Lucky 35. Wow. Now, um, of course, you voted Best Band and Best Album in the Melody Maker poll as well. And I think it's Q Magazine has voted yeah. OK Computer as the all-time top album in the universe, beating the Beatles, yeah. I mean, everybody. What's been your reaction to all of that? Uh, well, I got, I got back to... Because I hadn't seen Q, and I got back at Heathrow last night, and I had to catch the bus back to Oxford, and I thought, oh, I'll pick up Q, and it's like 100 Best Albums of all time. And, I was like leafing through and I saw Pablo Honey at 61. It's like, Jesus, you know, this is a bit strange. <laughs> and then going through it and like, hang on a sec, top 20. We're, we're not, and I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe the Benz or what, you know, I didn't. And they got to number six in the Benz and then Beatles at number two. And I remember turning over the page and like, <laughs> I want, it was like winning the FA Cup. I wanted to <laughs> shout down, down on this bus to what's like, yeah, you know, it's, I think part of it is it'd be interesting to see like in five years' time yeah. when they do a poll. I mean, it's obviously kind of made an impression this year, but if it lasts, well, then that's amazing. But still, you know. A deserved choice, do you think? I'm going to ask you to be modest here. I mean, what would be your choices? Let's first of all start with all time top 100. Okay. Um, Phil, for you first, what would be your all time favourite album if you had to Ooh. say? Can you think of one? Ed? I can okay. easy, very very easy. It's um, it's uh, Marvin Gaye. What's going on? Why you know? that album? Uh, I, it's like I, I, I didn't really. I mean, like you know, I was an indie kid, and up until about you know six years ago, I'd never really heard any of the old Motown stuff or any of the old soul stuff. And about three years ago, I someone did me a copy of this tape and did me and I did me a copy of what's going on and I put it on in the car and when we were doing the album I, I had to listen to that album every day I mean the man's voice was amazing mm. and he was a genius arranger and composer you know that album there's so much going on in there but it's it's like it's really subtle and it's just you know it's 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 a great album to 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 late at night and yeah it's just brilliant it's genius yeah what about for you phil have you come up with anything yeah i mean when i think back it's a, it's a big transformer lou reed so it's, it's an album i remember i had a tape it was when i was like mid-teens or whatever and it had transformer on one side and uh, uh velvet underground on the other and it's just one of those it's you know how you get albums which just become soundtracks to to like growing yeah. up and transform was definitely one of those there's another fact if i can ask you uh, this one very quickly before we ask the question for our competition oh one seven one five eight zero two thousand in fact it's from our very own ricky gervais who says can i be in your band or at least have some of your money <laughs> <laughs> have it all <laughs> i mean what I'll is get you far. i mean what has the success of uh, you know the last couple of years been able for you to do i mean you know how's it's it, i think what we've always done it i mean we've done it i think you know we've been touring now you know and doing this solidly for five and a half years and you know it's it, it, each time it's been getting your head to, to the level that you're at because it's always you know about three months ago i personally felt i think we all did that we were still the same band who um the same band at the same level as when we brought out the bends and suddenly you know these end of things like end of year mm. polls and stuff like that you, it needs a kind of a mental adjustment because you can't, you know, you can't go on thinking like, oh, you're just still a small band or whatever. So um, I think the most important thing is as long as the, 
that you know we've still got that that drive and and the discipline to make good records and we've still got you know we've still got some good music inside us i mean i i don't think we as a band want to carry on and be one of those bands that will carry on and make albums that we know aren't very good you know we're quite aware that what we we'd much rather make five really great albums like the smiths did or whatever and then if we made a bad album call it a day you know you know when it's bands have windows of op creative windows of opportunity and you 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 to, you deserve it to you know you owe it to yourself and also to people who into your music that when you bring out an album they know that it's going to be and you know it's a good one the day you start making bad albums is the day you stop making records i think as a band so um how do we get onto that? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. That's a good point, You've lost me. <laughs> okay, let's ask the question. There you go. Always, always a safety net. We've got four copies of the new single. Uh, this is four copies of CD1 and CD2. Um, CD1 featuring the two bonus tracks, Palo Alto and also How I Made My Millions, two new songs as well. Have mm -hmm. you got a question that we can ask? Yeah, yes, we have. On the recent UK tour that we did, um, what song did we uh, open, open the sets with? 0171580 we'll give it to the 25th the 50th the 75th and the 100th caller that's a bit of work from my producer um what was the uh, sets opener on the recent uk tour yeah. punch those digits now 0171580 and good luck let's play another record i know you guys have got a short shoot off at about 10 to 1 um morphine are up next yeah. and buena who's chosen this yeah i chose that uh, the, the band from boston and they're a really interesting band it's like a guy who plays two string bass and there's a saxophonist and a drum and i just i heard this track about four years ago and then got into morphine subsequently after and i just think it's a great sound it grooves well it's just a again it's a really good sort of smoky you know late night record late night record radio um to next i mean you've been together 12 years yeah phil can you believe that 12 years i try not to believe <laughs> it sometimes it's longer than most um, marriages <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's actually, uh, it's not seen that amount. No, it has hasn't. It? Yeah, it's funny because usually it's with bands as well, it gets more fraught the longer mm. they get on, but it's actually become, a, you know, a bit easier in terms of like, we sort of musically, I think we're, we're looking, we have more common ground nowadays than we used to, which might be a bad thing, I don't, we don't know, but I think we just want to make, you know, uh, what we've done on, on the bends, and we did it on Pablo Honey, but also on OK Computer. Was we we learnt with each record. We w we wanted to do something different for ourselves, and you know, and and to to learn something a new craft or whatever. So as long as we keep on learning and attempting to mm. do things that we haven't done before, but we're also aware that you know there are some things that you can't do. You know, if we were to totally get into like the dance thing or sequences and stuff like that, it might well be a big mistake because you know all the great stuff that's around at the moment. These people have been doing it for years. It's like being a guitar band you learn your trade and it takes you a while you know you've got to pay your dues and everything but if we could get a few of those elements in and just a few other stuff you know just that's how we've always worked yeah exactly. I mean, we've just been like real magpies stealing yeah from stealing bits <laughs> i mean, I mean you, you spoke a little bit earlier on about this um port portable studio um on tour i mean have, have you actually sort of started laying down new songs and ideas already um well, no, we haven't done Not really. Not really. The, the thing is, the trouble with Porter Studios is that one of the things we realise on OK Computer is that, you know, we play, when we play in a room, the five of us, we're actually quite good now. We used not to be, but we can actually play a bit nowadays. <laughs> so it's really... It's 12 years for it's, you. But it's <laughs> taken, exactly, it's taken yeah. 12 years because we couldn't play our instruments really when we started. So it, we, we've got to this stage, so... I hope that, you know, on the next album, as long as we keep playing, I mean, for, you know, for me, the best part about what we do is always the rehearsal. It's new songs, it's trying stuff out, and we, we, we know we, it's just a five of us in our room, you know, rehearsal room, and it's, it's just like it always was, mm. except we're playing better nowadays. So as long as we carry on playing together and don't lose that thing, you know, you hear about the Beatles, when they stop playing live, they stop playing together. And, it, I, I, you know, I think it's important that we, we... I'm not comparing us by any means, but, you know, it's important that we carry on playing as a band because then we'll just get, you know, we'll get better and, you know... Another factor as well as asked, are you playing any more rock and roll shows in England soon? We're not, unfortunately, no. Um, so what are the plans for the next 12 months? Can you um, well, for the next... Well, for the foreseeable future, we've, got, we've still got some, to do some more touring for OK Computer. We've got to, um, we're off to Japan, New Zealand and Australia, and then finishing up in, in the States. And then we actually want to take some, some time away from it, because, I mean, a lot's happened over this, this past year, and I think we just want to sit back, 
reassess everything really just uh, just decide where, where we're going to go next yeah we, we don't really want to rush into anything yeah um and so that's that's where we're going to be hopefully we'll start work on on the album um early autumn the next album and um we'll just have to see how how quickly or how how slowly that album will be made well, look, listen, thanks for coming by Pleasure. and um, paying us a visit. Many, many thanks. You talked a little bit earlier on about the five of you being in the studio, being able to play now as well. Yeah. Talk us through the conception of uh, one of the new songs um, on the single, No Surprises, um, mm. Palo, Palo Alto. Alto. How did that come about? Well, it was one of the songs we rehearsed up when we were rehearsing for, for OK Computer, and it was a kind of like, we, we get bored very easy, and it's quite a straight-ahead song, so we were like, oh, well, we'll just leave this... And we rehearsed it a bit, and then when we were looking for scratching our heads, like, we've got a B-side to do, no surprise, it's got to come up, we've got to do a B-side, and it's like, well, let's try and do it on the back, do it in the back of the bus, and, and you got you and Tom got a rhythm program for it, mm. so that we could, the, the, the guitarists and stuff, and could put something down to them, then we finished that, and then got in the studio for the day, and you put down the drums yeah. to, the, to the backing track, so, um, it, it, it's kind of, yeah, it's pretty heavy, the choruses are quite extreme on this. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a listen, many thanks again. XFM 104.9 and this morning's edition of Good Morning London is about to draw to a close. That's Radio Heaven from the new single, No Surprises, one of the new tracks, Paolo Alto. Hope you're enjoying the music. Claire Sturgis is going to be up very, very shortly. Oh, Jim, what's your microphone doing? <laughs> Tend to calm down. Uh, anyway, enjoy.